Okay, everyone, I welcome all of you to our international global panel discussion under Squish banner. My name is Noin. I am a director of communication and events at Squist. And uh, I am a chair of Squish Science Symposium, which is a national competition of young women scientists across Canada. Um, from uh, And one thing to tell you that this event is also sponsored by Kruger. I will go to our, my next slide. Before we start our event, I would like to give land acknowledgement. We would like to take a moment and reflect on our connection to the land and thank the traditional guardians of that land, which we at Squist Vancouver live and work. Vancouver is on the unceded ancestral and traditional lands of Musqueam, Slewatu, Seychelles, and Squamish and indigenous people of Turtle Island. There are some housekeeping rules. If you are not uh, speaking, please keep your uh, audio muted. Keep your mobile, si mobile phone silent. And please note that this event is being recorded and it will be uploaded on the YouTube later on in Swiss channel. Uh, chat box will be monitored and they, uh, all question and answer from audience will be taken later on. Our agenda is that first is the introduction, the second is the panel discussion. After panel discussion, we will have a, a poll question, audience poll, and then we will have a brief discussion about the result of that poll. Then we will have networking blitz where we will create the breakout rooms. And in breakout rooms, you will get a chance to talk to the speakers to ask them questions about the challenges that you are facing in STEM environment at your workplace. After that, we will give the closing remarks. From there on, I will give this floor to Priyanka. Priyanka is PhD student at INRIS and she is with her uh, main area of research is neuroscience. She is also communications lead at Squist. And from here, I will uh, give this floor to Priyanka and I will mute myself. Priyanka, uh, you can now take it on. I will stop yes. sharing the screen. Hello everybody again, and thank you for being on the panel, making the time. Uh, we will try to keep the discussion as peppy as possible so that our audience in India doesn't go off to sleep. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off introducing our panelists. I will give a brief introduction as to what everybody is doing currently, and then you will have the floor so that you can describe your journey in a little bit more detail, because I, I sensed that all of, all of our panelists have gone through a very wide spectrum of in the countries where they have lived and the courses that they have done and the journeys that they have gone through. So maybe you can take us through that uh, when you introduce yourselves. Okay. So starting with Geraldine in no particular order, uh, she is right now an associate professor at INRS in environmental toxicology. Her research program aims to determine how environmental stress stressors uh, during critical periods of early life can alter male germ cell programming and ultimately impair male fertility. Her work has involved international collaborations resulting in over 30 publications and books with over 50 presentations at national and international meetings. She is an active member of multiple Quebec research networks in reproduction, environmental health and endocrine disruption uh, endocrine disruptions, and is the president of Society of Toxicology of Canada. She is also uh, has been the chair of the EDI Committee of Quebec Network in Reproduction since 2019. And most importantly for us, she helps promote the visibility of the LGBTQ plus community in STEM. Welcome, Geraldine. Next, we have Karishma Kaushik. Very impressive line of degrees, I must say. <laughs> she is MBBS, MD, PhD, and assistant professor, and a Ramalinga uh, re-entry fellow at Institute of Bioinformatics and Biotechnology uh, at Savitri Bai Phule Pune University. She is a physician scientist, as her degrees tell us. 
Uh, she leads a research group uh, that studies biofilms using human relevant approaches. Apart from her research, she's involved in various initiatives across science ecosystems, such as leading science diplomacy initiatives at the Global Young Academy uh, for building a national society for biofilm researchers in India and co-leading India's foremost science outreach platform for children, that is Talk to a Scientist. Welcome, Karishma. And now Thank we have <laughs> we have Francisca with us. Uh, she is currently the CEO of TMAZ. Uh, it is an entrepreneurship and training hub that specializes in training of youth on on various entrepreneurship skill acquisition programs, such as uh, millinery craft and baking. She is an African Change Maker Fellow and an advocate for women and girls empowerment. She has worked and volunteered with various organizations and is an enabler with Young Star Foundation, where she maintain, mentors and trains young girls to think, imagine, and achieve greatness. She has worked as a digital trainer with Bestie Network in Africa under the Her Digital Google Skills for Africa 2018, where she trained over 150 youth. Recently, she has gotten called back uh, to her alma mater uh, as a graduate assistant, where she is learning firsthand work ethics uh, for her career advancement. Welcome, Francisca. Thank you very much, Priyanka. Thank you. Thank you all again. I think we can start with Geraldine. Maybe you can let us know a little bit about your journey now. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. I feel very um, privileged to be sitting next to these uh, amazing women with me today and all around the world. We were saying that uh, Charisma and Francisca are actually in the future for me because <laughs> they're like five and, and nine year uh, hours ahead of us. <laughs> anyway, so to tell you about me, um, I was born and raised in Paris, France, and um, I've done all my training there until my PhD. So I had a PhD in reproductive and uh, development, uh, reproduction and development, so uh, mostly biology field. And then I originally came to Montreal, Canada, with a two-year uh, work contract to do a postdoc and then I ended up staying way longer because I'm still in Montreal and that was back in 2005. <laughs> so I did um, what is authorized in Canada which is a five-year postdoc and uh, we were dealing with issues of what we call oncofertility meaning the impact of cancer treatment on male fertility so it was absolutely fascinating and and I'm still working on this kind of related research. And then I, I became a research associate at the McGill University Health uh, Center and I was working in neurology research so all aimed to uh, uh, help and treat male fertility. And then I got lucky and I got an assistant professor position at INRS in uh, Montreal or in Laval which is just north Montreal and that was back in 2012. So I've been lucky enough that I could uh, develop my lab for the last uh, nine years, uh, during which I had the, the pleasure and the, the, I was grateful to work with uh, awesome people and, and especially very good trainees that uh, got a chance to come and work with me. And um, apart from my work, um, many things happened in the last nine years. Um, so I also became a mom, a mom of twins who are now three years and a half um, old. And um, also, you know, like on the side of my research, I got involved um, for the last five years in uh, EDI issues. And um, so I, I was uh, at first pretty naive about all this. And, and so I educated myself by being part of some committees in international societies. And I was just like kind of listening to what was going on. And then for the last three years, I think I've been more active and trying to um, educate um, my research network and my research fellows, my institution, trying to participate in some policy changes, um, trying to create more um, safe space around us and um, promoting what I think is lacking, which is uh, the LGBTQ visibility in, in STEM. Um, maybe it's a privilege that we can actually do this in North America, but I think it's very important that we actually do it. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to 
do this as much as I can on the side of my research. So that's it about me. More power to you, Geraldine. Thank <laughs> you so much for the introduction. Um, Karishma, would you like to go next? Uh, certainly, certainly, Priyanka. Wonderful panel and great to meet both of you, Geraldine and Francesca. Um, uh, you know, I was talking about 9.30 p.m. in India, but these, these uh, interactions make it all worth it. Um, so, well, I was born and raised in Mumbai, India, and I must say I came from an urban, upwardly mobile, middle-class family. My mother is a physician. My father had his own business. So I was extremely privileged and um, possibly not aware of being a woman or a girl early in my, early, uh, during my life in India. Then I went to medical school in Pune, after which I did a residency. So we had already talked of nine years of formal medical education. Um, when I, I must say, you know, because we have a large South Asian audience here and um, the focus is, of course, being open about our journeys. Uh, when at the end of nine years, my parents said, I think you should get married. And I said, I haven't found anybody. And then in typical South Asian style, they said, oh, we'll find someone for you. Don't worry. And uh, well, that's what happened. Um, so I, my, my husband was introduced to me by, my, by our parents. Uh, the, joke that, the joke is that first our parents started getting along and then we started getting along. In any case, he was based in California. He, was, he described himself as your typical software, Indian software engineer based in California. I got married after my residency and moved to the United States. It was at that time we took this early decision that we probably want to come back to India at some point in the future. We looked us at ourselves more as expatriates than immigrants. And so I decided not to requalify through the US medical licensing system. I said, let me do a PhD. I did not get a PhD in California for two years, though I worked at UC Berkeley because there was no money to support international students. All the NIH and NSF funding needed green card holders or American citizens. So at the end of two years, um, my husband said, my spouse said, you know, apply everywhere. We'll go where you get it. You've tried hard enough to make it work amongst these very, very competitive schools in California. I applied everywhere and it seemed to be Texas was the place calling us. So then we moved from California to Texas and people were asking us, what are you doing? One, who leaves California? And two, you know nothing about Texas. Nevertheless, we landed in a blue dot in the red state, which was Austin, uh, in the huge state of Texas. And I started my PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. At this time, I was 30 years old. We had been married for a while, and I wanted to start a family. It was really at this point that being a woman in STEM hit me when I started to look for prospective labs. Um, I was also very honest, I would say naive in retrospect. So I went to people and said, look, I'm expecting a child, though you can't see it yet. I'm expecting a child, but I still want to do this PhD and I'm, I'm going to get there. I was denied by three out of the three labs I rotated in. One happened to be a woman, an Indian woman scientist who said a uh, PhD is hard enough without a baby. I don't see how you're going to do it. So talk about, you know, skin, similar skin does not mean kin. She was an Indian woman scientist who said that to me. The two were, of course, men who ran these very driven PhD programs where people came in at six in the morning and I think they never left. Anyway, I said, all right, I petitioned the program for a fourth rotation and it happened to be uh, a young woman who had moved from Chicago to start her lab at Austin. And I again went in and said, I want to do a PhD with you, but I also want you to know I'm going to have a baby in six months. And she replied, oh, that's wonderful. That makes the two of us. So it so happened that my PhD advisor and I had our babies a week apart. I ended up finishing my PhD with her in five years. The science was way out of my comfort zone. It was a biophysics lab. It used a lot of quantitative methods to study biological phenomena. It was a steep learning curve. I didn't anticipate the science. I mean, there was no choice. I had been denied by three labs and I needed to make this work. But it was a great experience. It was a lab where I could walk out at 4 p.m. saying, I need to go home and relieve the nanny. My child is unwell. I will work from home. Because she was in exactly the same situation that I was. There was this mutual appreciation and respect for making choices that went beyond our academic goals. So we finished the PhD in five years and we went to Texas saying we are going to get out of Texas as soon as possible. We stayed on for 10 years. And we left Texas only when it meant coming back to India. So in 2018, we pulled the plug 
and moved back to India. Once again, people said, what are you doing? Uh, you know, India to the United States is a one way street. Nobody goes back. Nevertheless, we, we uh, live, left the life we had built over a decade, moved back to India. And I started my independent position on a re-entry fellowship from the government of India at U University of Pune. Uh, it's been a steep curve here again, uh, battling a very different ecosystem that I, I, so I left India as a doctor. I returned to India as a scientist. I've never done science in India. It's a large public university where the focus is teaching. Um, well, anyway, we can talk about that in detail. It's been fun. It's been interesting. And I'm, I think um, I strongly advocate being a vocal woman in science and being a visible mother in science. So that's where it stands. That, that's been an exciting journey. I mean, to the listener, I'm sure you had your own struggles going through that. Yeah, a little too exciting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can totally relate to the fact that uh, when you said your parents were uh, trying to find a boy to get you married, my mom is, I think, in the audience somewhere. I'm like, listen, mom. <laughs> <She's saying something." laughs> well, you know, it, it does work, at least in our yeah. system, some, in some strange way. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Francisca, would you like to introduce us uh, yourself to us? All right. Uh, thank you very much. And it's a great privilege to be part of this panel discussion. I'm really excited. Okay, I am Francisca, like you all know. I was born and brought up in a small community in Nigeria. And my journey in STEM started right back at senior secondary school, where um, I discovered that I could, I could actually study uh, some of the science courses that were perceived to be very tough by some persons, especially my uh, immediate friends, I could uh, actually study these courses with so much ease and less effort. So from high school, I decided to take up uh, college studies in medical biochemistry. And due to this ease with which I could actually study, I graduated top of my class. And as a result, that was why uh, the university decided to retain me as a graduate assistant. I'm currently a master's student at the Center for Food Technology and Research Center, Benue State University. And uh, I'm hoping to learn so much and to also create great input in today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all again. So. Yeah. I'm going to start with the first question for us. Okay, I'm going to admit somebody's coming. We fairly got in a sense of, uh, of your journeys now. And I think most of us come from a certain sense of privilege. So I guess that nullifies the question I want to ask. But still, uh, given that you have lived in different societies, if you can pull that perspective in, in answering, when was the first time for you? I, I know, Karishma, you said it was not up until you actually got pregnant is when it actually hit you that it would be different to be a woman than being a man in, in, in STEM. Um, but even otherwise, uh, with regards to the societies you have lived and survived in, when was the first time you registered that you are a specific gender and that, that it means something different to you than it would to, say, a cis man, for instance? Uh, anyone could start. Um, I can start. Hmm. So, you know, I've always known I was, I, I am a girl. <laughs> and um, as Karish was, was saying earlier, like it, it was, um, it, was uh, never, it never appeared to me to be a difference. When I was growing up, you know, I have two very strong sisters and I have my mom is an MD and to me, like I always had like, I guess role models of women who were strong and doing just the exact same as men. And so to me, it just didn't really appear as being, um, you know, an obstacle or anything uh, to, to, be, to be honest. So as a reminder, I, I grew up in France. And so this, this kind of thing, I, I, it, it now that I'm opening to all this question appears to be very uh, present in the society and the same in North America that there is a difference between how you raise a boy and a girl where it shouldn't but it's still there <laughs> um, so you know like my realization of all this came, came very late I think um, I think I'm a very naive person who uh, kind of sees things now that I'm 
um, getting open to understand and see it. Um, in my career, it feels like I have never been, you know, judged differently. But this, I think, comes with the fact that I just didn't think it could be. <laughs> so it might have been, and I don't know, you know. And in my journey, as you, you've heard, I, <clears throat> I became a mom late. I, and maybe I became a, a mom late um, and consciously because I didn't have any more challenge to do, or I, I do, I, you always have a challenge, but I mean, I had a position, I got tenure right when I got pregnant, and I think that had an impact, I mean, like, it kind of relieved my psycho, <laughs> my stress, and so this is where, you know, my whole body um, actually was okay to become pregnant, and and so maybe this is one of the, the most hurdles that, um, that I've lived. Hmm. But be honest is just that when you when you start seeing these differences, you see them every day in the way people talk. Um, you know, like you, my peers, they don't ask the same question to a male colleague to a female colleague. <laughs> this is becoming <laughs> apparent to me now. Like people, they actually talk more about emotion to women when they never question emotion to on to male colleague, which is kind of something that I find very weird. So. These will be my, my two things, like, you know, pregnancy and then when it comes to emotion. Why, why do you always emphasize emotion with women and not men? It's just something, something that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. How about you, Karishma? Um, so I think definitely it hit me when I, I chose to have a child during a PhD. Uh, it was And this was in the United States. Um, and it, I don't think it's different in most systems in the world. But I, I, I didn't expect it. I thought if there's any country in the world where this would be, you know, said or oh, whatever, these things happen. People have babies. They still do other great things with their life. It was actually very shocking that a graduate program in the United States did not have a formal maternity policy, mm. for example. They didn't have break rooms for lactation. You had to go to a neighboring building room, if at all, you wanted to um, avail that. Um, they also didn't have a way to pay people when they were not in the lab. So it often meant you had to take teaching assignments and how do you teach if you're on maternity leave? Yeah. So I actually had to end up funding my own maternity leave, to be honest. Because I had to get a substitute to teach and obviously no one would want to do it without remuneration, so I had to pay her to teach. So I was yeah. extraordinarily shocked that a graduate program in the United States didn't have a maternity policy because they never expected it. I mean, uh, firstly, to start a PhD at 30 and then, the, you know, to decide to become a mother, it was very unconventional. It seemed it should not have been so, though. And I, my argument was, what if a male graduate student had had a fracture and not been able to come for two months? What would you do? And the reply was, well, that's at least... I mean, that's unplanned. Here we know you're not going to be there for three months. So it's worse. I said, I would think being planned is worse than being it's unplanned. Better, right. Right. So it was all quite a hot mess at that point. Um, you know, fortunately, we could just afford to, to skip those, the stipend for, the first, for, the, for a few months. Hmm. But then again, that would also uh, come with a certain sense of comfort that you had, assuming if there is somebody who doesn't have a strong support system yes, and yes. It, in that system, it would be even harsher. Very much so. But and, and, and even with that comfort, it came with insecurity that what if they throw me out of the program? What if they say she's not committed to follow through on it? And all of that definitely played played into my head. The only advantage was that I had an advisor who was supportive as best as possible hmm. even if though there wasn't an institution or establishment that was prepared for such situations hmm. how about you francisca okay well i got to realize about my gender at a very early stage because growing up wasn't really um, like in a typical nigerian society where we are being made to do the girl stuff because um there was one certain period i wanted to engage in say skating the, the skating sport i saw uh, boys around my environment skating so i decided to join them for the training but on getting home my father uh, told me he said 
don't you know you're a girl and you are not expected to engage in such sports? So at that point, I began to, I limited the kind of activities I went for and it's kind of served as a segregator to me because I was limited by so many things because mm. he would say a girl is expected to de- do this, a girl is expected to do this. So there are certain things expected by me. So all of those thoughts put into my head, so kind of served as a segregator to me, which uh, limited me, but not completely because as I was determined, I still kept pushing on and pushing on. Thank you. So then, uh, Francisca, let me start with you. So, all right. <laughs> given that you were determined, but although, uh, as uh, Karishma rightly pointed out, it does your determination does come with a whole lot of insecurities because you have yes. to push through and you don't know where the limit is exactly and what is okay and what is not okay. And the so- society okay. around you is constantly telling you one thing or another. So oh, in yeah. a in in a condition like that, how how do you overcome within yourself those challenges? Do you then set limits that uh, this is what my society is expecting out of me and say it is X, then I will only go up to Y when maybe you could actually go much higher. So does that, does that play into how you set your goals and how you achieve them and how you look at goals in life? Well, thank you very much. That is where um, self-confidence comes into play because when you build that level of self-confidence within yourself, even the society cannot stop you because you tend to set those goals and work towards them. So there is no limit to how much you can, you can achieve. So at that point, I did not limit myself, even when there were so many factors around me, like starting from my peers telling me, okay, science courses are usually very tough, so why go for them? I said, okay, let me just go for myself. Let me see for myself if truly they are tough. So I'll get it there. I discovered I could actually study them with so much ease. So why were they telling me it was tough? So usually I want to explore these things. Let me see for myself and confirm that, okay, true or not. So mm. basically that is the self I think she is, yeah, okay. How, how does it work for both of you, Geraldine and Karishma? Like, do you, do you externally or internally become self-critical in setting goals? Like now that even you are both mothers, so I, I have read that that comes, mother's guilt is something you just take to your grave, basically. So uh, how, how does that play into your, your goals that you set and, and you achieve? Would you like to go, Geraldine? Mm-hmm. Go, go ahead, you... Karishma, go. Uh. So I think I plowed through the PhD. I wanted to do it so badly. I just did it. And honestly, with with all the coordination of baby and nanny and everything, I didn't have time to worry too much about what people were thinking of me. So it was a good, it was a good time, you know. I just tried to get through it. Mother's guilt, of course, set in after that because I took a three-year uh, uh, assistant professor of teaching at UT Austin because I, I felt I had missed a few years and it was just very busy at that time. So... I mean, that kind of set in, but I think I just went through it with blinkers and said, I'm not going to take any more input. I'm already overwhelmed. So I don't need more people to tell me that whether it was the right time to have a child during the PhD or can she do it? And I think it, it, I, I think somewhere that has just come into even moving back to India or trying to make it work in India. And of course, we'll come to that subsequently. Yeah. Just have blinders on, basically. <laughs> How about you, Geraldine? Yeah, I like both these answers, like self-confidence and the blinders, you know, just ignore it as much as you can, <laughs> or you lower that voice in your head that says, oh my God, you can do it, you can do it. Yes, you can. You just, If you want to do it, you just have to try. Um, but um, yes, it, it's not easy. So it's... Um, it's, it's um, the way I overcome it, I think, is by surrounding me with people who trust in me more than I trust in myself, you know, like if, you, if you're lucky enough to have the, at least one person in your environment that helps you, you know, see it with a positive eye, that helps a lot. So this is why, like, in my action and in my institution, we were talking about the parental leave, you know, and, and um, we we're trying to create 
um, options for women who um, who don't have any stipend during parental leave. Like I was very surprised to actually find out not later than two days ago that Quebec government uh, funding uh, international students actually stopped funding while if that person goes on a parental leave. So that person uh, ended up being zero dollar in their pocket from one day to the other. So through some research network or through institutional policy, there's way to act on this. And so if, if we are talking out loud about this issue, I think people will hear. And so this is how we're gonna overcome those issues is by talking about it, seeing them, identifying solution and making them in place. And I think that's that's how we're gonna do it. And it's mm -hmm. gonna be hard as everything we just said, but we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> adapt the system so that it fits everyone. Yeah. But that's a good segue into into my next question is how much of a role does your environment play and in an environment could mean a whole lot of things. Uh, I, I like to me coming from India, I understand how sometimes the society weighs in heavier than your immediate parents or family or, or, or that sort of a thing, because there are so many voices coming in that, oh, look, she's doing this at this age still, and she's not married still, or she's not had a child still, and, you know, the whole, whole lot of things. Uh, uh, so one, how, how is that society for both of you, uh, uh, Francisca and Geraldine? And in among that, uh, as you said, Geraldine, it is important to have that one person who trusts in you more than you do sometimes in yourself. So how do you nurture that and how do you create that uh, when when things are really not going your way? Uh, any Anyone could start, I guess, Geraldine. Just by staying with an open mind, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and most often it comes from the one that you didn't expect. Um, you see, like uh, I, I really like this idea that in in both my co-panelists here, there was surprised of actually who was the most supportive to you, right? You didn't expect that to happen, and then boom, it happened. And and sometimes even though you don't even realize that person is that person right now, and you'll see it in the future, uh, you'll realize in the future that you you've moved forward be thanks to that person. So, you know, it's, 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 I think that to answer your question about nurturing it is just to stay open and, and to be a human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, but um, yeah. And, and, maybe, and maybe keep some naivety and positivity is, is part of the recipe. <laughs> I think. It's interesting how just being a human is something we have gotten down to just saying, like, it's not taken for granted. You have to say, just be human. It's okay. <laughs> how about you, Karishma? I mean, I would agree. Absolutely. A PhD advisor can be the most supportive person in your ecosystem, though you may least expect it. But it also changed how I approached it. And in a way, looking back, and though I didn't notice it at the time, looking back, it was actually an instrumental instrumental to surviving a very tough academic phase. So you know how every PhD student wants to publish in nature and science and cell and PNAS. And I was like, all I want is a PhD and my child alive at the end of five years. Like that's my criteria right now. And I did publish. It wasn't in cell science or nature, but it was in solid good society journals, which are very well respected, you know. Mm -hmm. So it kind of made me say, look, this is my benchmark. You can chase what you want, but I'm not putting additional pressure. I have I have taken on more in my life. I have the perspective to see that all of that also mattered at that point in time. Looking back, having a child was actually, it, I didn't survive a PhD because of that, but it was a, a, a rather because of, you know, how in spite of having a child, but rather it was instrumental in helping me get there because it just right. gave me this perspective. I had set my benchmark. Hmm. How about you, Francisca? Hello, Priyanka. Sorry, I got a network interruption, so I don't know if you could come again with a question. Yeah, so uh, what we were talking about is um, as your journey and all of our journeys have been very, very, could be very much influenced by the societies that we are surrounded in, uh, 
even even when you are determined to do something there could be a lot of uh, thoughts and pressures that could weigh down on you so in times like these how would you how how do you rely on one person how do you nurture an environment that pushes you and that supports you when we you don't believe uh, in yourself in in moments of weakness when you are not doing so well basically so well okay before i got married my my sister has always been like my support system so she believes in me and she's always there to support me whenever i'm down so she's a force uh, a call person i can always call to whenever i need uh, some motivation or some boost but after i got married i because i was really careful with who, with who i wanted to get married to because it was like uh, one of my criteria and yes someone who would support my career and the uh, vision in stem so my spouse has really been supportive and uh, i've always been uh, open to learning new things and also my 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 professors in school really supportive and i think it it has been helping me in a lot of ways thank you mm -hmm. Would would either of you like to share a specific incident that that stood in your mind as an important marker of support or at a crucial moment that somebody supported you and that is something you would also you know pay back in your mentorships or 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 when you interact with people? I mean, many um quite a few, but I think one that really struck me is in two thousand fourteen. I told my PhD advisor that. Uh, my husband is getting really good job offers from Google and uh, Apple in the Bay Area, and we may at some point need to go back to the San Francisco Bay Area. And now looking back at it, her reply was, "We will expeditiously get you out. Most of the work is done. We will find a way to get you to graduate in the next twelve months." I took it for granted. I just walked out saying, "You know, that was easy." But I'm really thank you, thank you. But it's only later when I heard these toxic stories of advisor mentee relationships that I realized what that meant. She, I mean, somebody could turn around and say, "Do you even want to do this PhD?" I mean, are you even serious about it? First, you become a mother, and now you tell me you need to leave Texas, and you know, somebody could have said all of that. Right. And all she said was, "You know, I understand. We will expeditiously get you out." it was as simple as that you know if somebody had given me a hard time i don't think i would have stayed on in academia for sure mm. and that became a turning point to me that there can be supportive people and good scientists who build good cultures around them how about you francisca is is there a specific incident of support to your stem career that that really meant a lot to you and that you keep in mind or that actually boosted you yes now looking back at my stem my journey in stem um i would like to mention a, a particular person who supported me um my my university professor especially the dean of my faculty he has really been supportive now he's someone who look at you and said francisca i believe in you and uh, I know you can do this. So having that person who says I believe in you and most times it, the person even believes in you more than you believe in yourself. So at that point I do not have any option than to stay focused and just keep looking at that goal and just pushing forward and when whatever he is doing in his research work and everything he tends to carry me along so I don't get lost or the way. So it has really been helpful and he has been an inspiring person to me how about you geraldine i can share two very different examples um the first one is uh, really related to my academic career and um i was midway in my postdoc and i i got an opportunity to have a professor position so the university actually told me that i had to uh, apply for grants and um that the you know the final results might my may interfere with the decision but that that part wasn't clear it was kind of like you get the position so you have our support go for a grant application and so uh, sorry to say this this way but i worked my ass off <laughs> for these grants <laughs> application and i had to do this at the same time as my postdoc and um so grant application usually you have to wait for about five months before you have an answer and so all this was kind of done 
you know, with the support of my my postdoc supervisor and everything. And and then at the end of the five months out of the two grant application, I got one, but not the second one. And the university contacted me to say, well, sorry, but because you didn't get that one, we're not going to offer you the position. So, you know, I had I had invested maybe, you know, a total of more than half a year in this working really hard and, and believing this is what was going to happen. And then boom. So I felt very hard. And um, again, my postdoc supervisor was just the best. And um, because I, I ended up going to his office and I said, you know what? I'm giving up, uh, I'm taking a break, I'm taking a plane back home, I need to see my family, and I don't know when I'm going to go back, I'm, I'm going to come back, so, and I was so pissed, <laughs> sorry, that I just said, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure I'm going to come back, so if you want to cut my contract, it's fine, I was just giving up, and he didn't let me, he said, well, go back, and then when you come back, you just email me that you're back in the lab the next day. And so I left <laughs> and I, I did come back <laughs> and you see where I am now. So it's just like if those, this support at that step, you know, if it, if it didn't act that way, I wouldn't be where I am now. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing that I can share is the fact that I became a homo parent uh, in my professional life. Um, so my, the other parent of my kids are, is a woman. And so we kind of struggled having kids and, and, and without the support of all my colleagues and their openness and their, you know, like their will to be educated around us because they didn't know, <laughs> um, really helped me struggle um, between my career and doing this in the same time, which is uh, one of the things that our, my work environment could change and uh, on top of parental leave is the recognition of the need for assisted reproductive technologies sometimes. And, um, you know, many, many more couples are getting infertile. And so this is something that actually takes a lot of space in one's life. It could be a, a mom, a dad or whoever. It, it affects a couple. And uh, parenthood is a journey. It's not just, you know, a parental leave. It, uh, it starts way before and it, it lasts way longer than those six months of, you know, your leave. It's your, your kids are still there um afterwards you need to take care of them and and so all this i think is uh is something that that maybe needs to be more considered in stem and that 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 is not just for women it, it should more and more also be for everyone and and, and dads and and whoever parents you know so mm, that's that's heartening uh to hear Thank you for sharing that story. Um, again, it, it, it gives a good segue into my next question, which is now that you have been through a certain part of your journey where you have the tools or sometimes you are in the position to create an environment around you, you can do the decision making, even if it is as restricted as a space as your own lab, uh, for for instance, or, or your own family now, because more all three of you are mothers. So first part of my question is, uh, how would you approach the topic of gender with, with your kids? How would you not let them get affected? Now, I give great power to all three of you because you had the determination to put blinders on and focus, but that does not negate the voices that were still there. And the society is still slowly, gradually getting used to the fact that there is equal representation. There should be equal representation. God knows when it will actually get there. Um, but how do you, uh, I don't want to say protect, but have sort of a provide a stable nurturing environment for your kid or for anybody in your academic institution or your lab so that they develop a sensible, again, humane idea for gender, that it's just human, and um, not let that burden them. And any one of you could start. So, I mean, I have a son, and in my parenting journey, it's actually been a little different because uh, it's kind of having to make him feel okay with liking things that girls also like because we are so conditioned even in the United States with this whole blue and pink business and then coming back to India certainly maybe a lack of sensitivity nuanced approach to it so there was a sudden embarrassment with saying that I like this American drama ever after high or something which apparently a lot of 
young girls enjoy watching. And even now he says things like, I want to grow up to be a fashion designer, which in India we would, oh, fashion is for girls. So it has actually been applying what I maybe learned as a mother in STEM in, in a kind of a reverse fashion, a pun intended with fashion, you know, by saying, okay, boys also design fashionable clothes and look at all these fashion designers who are men. And it doesn't mean you have to be embarrassed of it. Yeah. Yeah. So we are still in, I want to be a fashion designer phase and it's totally fine with his parents. He has to get fine with talking about it with his peers, which is where the challenge is right now. So I assume there would be a lot of work you would have to do backhand. Like if he comes back to you and says, oh, this person is saying that and that person is saying that, then I guess you would have to be responsible. I, I don't know if that's the right word to use to engage in that conversation. Is, is that yeah, yeah, so we say so many things. There are girls who are astronauts and you know, scientists are women and, you know, so men can do fashion and men can design stuff. Luckily, now there's a pandemic. Luckily for him, in the sense, all his designs of fashionable clothes are at home. Mm -hmm. So they're not quite getting out of the house. But there's some beautiful designs. Um, uh, Met Gala worthy designs. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of play it the other way and say, oh, you know, you have women in space and women drive trucks. and So it's actually very interesting. You grow up having to apply these things in different contexts mm -mm. How, yeah. how about you Gerardi? i'll come last to you francisca because your kid is just just really young i i would like to know what Geraldine has to say well i don't talk about gender with my kids <laughs> they're twins and and they're a girl and a boy so um we're in that very um you know like it would be a typical conversation we have right but but we don't and and i find it funny because i learn from them more than i teach them um you know mm -hmm. they're at three and a half years old and at school or at daycare i would should say they <clears throat> they actually make a big difference between what girls and boys do they put them in different corners with different toys and things and so um i my my daughter is very aware she's a girl <laughs> And, and my, my son, when I say, so are you a boy? Sometimes I say that. And he said, no, I'm Raphael. And that's it. He doesn't want to be named a girl or a boy. And I, I find it very interesting, actually. And it, it's been there for a year now. So we'll see what happens with that. And very often I am Mr. Mom. So, you know, like it doesn't really make a difference. And, I, and so I think I'm going to nurture this. I'm going to, you know, let them mix and, and, and not make a difference. What I find is very um, hard is the book, the kids book. Those are very, you know, they're very heteronormative and they also assign gender activities. And, and so I change the stories and I try to find some books that are more inclusive. And I, I, um, I, I give to the daycare some inclusive books, you know, to be read. And um, I sometimes ask the, the, the caregiver not to specifically, like systematically talk about a mom and a dad or you know girls and boys activities so that that hopefully will help more inclusivity in their education but as far as it comes for the lab you know my solution is just to say any newcomer that any disrespectful comments or um, attitude or event is going to be hurt and punished <laughs> and that we don't tolerate that Okay. How about you, Francisca? Do you have a, 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 an image, a picture in mind, how you would like to go about it? <laughs> All right. My baby is just 20 months old, but, but then we started, just like Karishma said uh, about the issue of colors, because the society has made it in such a way that they tell you pink is for girls and blue is for boys. So all of those societal constructs are, uh, well, no way to go to because I introduced my baby to both colors, blue or pink, whichever she gets to make the choice and which she loves best and also the kind of toys because they, the society believes a baby doll is for a baby girl, then the, the superhero toys is for baby boys and all. So, but I introduce her to both toys, both the baby doll, the superhero toys, and the kind of cartoons and everything. So I don't restrict her, I don't limit her to certain cartoons or certain toys or certain colors. So that when she grows, she gets to choose and take up those decisions on her own. So basically that is it. 
I, I would like to delve a little bit more on the lab side of it, uh, Karishma, uh, because I guess you couldn't, uh, we didn't get to you to share about it. How, how do you, how do you manage, like uh, you and Geraldine both and Francisca, also if you have shared uh, stories where uh, an academic support was crucial for all three of you, but uh, as a person now in a position of running a lab, how do you, is there something you have to specifically do in order to create a safe environment uh, within the lab? Because I would assume that over and about the upbringing that we have had, which is fairly privileged, the people who might uh, like participate in working in your lab at various positions would come from various degrees of privilege. Okay. Sometimes something we are not even aware of is actually happening in societies since we, we were not raised that way. So how do you get your, so I would assume it takes a lot of effort on your part to get your head around it first and then be in a safe space to give them the kind of support and, and push that they would need. How do all three of you uh, go around that? Have you ever faced something like that in, in your STEM lives? So moving back to India, I realized that there are many more constructs at play than just gender. You know? So there's one thing that we manage our team, but we are also part of institutions. And sometimes we don't have control over what people in leadership positions in the institute have to say. So in India, it's beyond gender, Priyanka. There's religion, mm -hmm. there's caste, there is rural versus urban, the divide. Um, there's also economic privilege and mm -hmm. social privilege that plays out in many different ways. So in our team, and there's no question, you know, you hire based on abilities, capabilities, you work. But there are lots of things that are obviously said at other, you know, at different aspects of the institute. Sometimes the challenge for me has been how much of a call do I take on it? How yeah. much, you know, how much do I constantly put myself out there? Because then it creates problems elsewhere when you keep making issues up where people label you a misfit for a particular institute, for example, and try and create problems with your work elsewhere. So it's, it's basically when you hear random remarks being spoken, mm -hmm. generalized remarks about certain types of people, you know, it's, ir it's ironic, the same issues of race that we bristle at when we are minority, for example, right. in North America, we come here and say, wow, now my privilege means I need to speak up. Yes. Right. And I never forget that. That has been the highlight of my return to India journey, that there were things I would never have tolerated to be spoken of people of color. And now they're not spoken of people of color, but people of different religions and castes and oh, they come people who come from this part of India and so on. So in our group, we have control. My challenge is we don't have much control beyond that. Correct. So that's where I am with that. Okay. Have, have you ever experienced something like that, uh, Francisca and Geraldine? Maybe Francisca can go first. Well, since I'm still quite new in the journey of STEM and uh, I'm, I haven't particularly experienced so much, but I'm hoping to continue to learn and then get, gather more experiences. Over to you, Geraldine. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think the key is to educate. Um, so uh, you can educate yourself and you can participate in the education of your surrounding by providing access to conferences, speakers, inviting speakers on the topic and, and hoping that people will grasp whatever they can. <laughs> um, I think the whole thing comes with respect, right? You have to, the, the, to me, it's the key word. Everyone needs to respect their, their peers, their colleagues, their who, whoever is in their professional environment. And especially in their professional environment, I mean, like you have to be <clears throat> respectful, whatever your thoughts are. Um, I'm not expecting anyone to change their mind if they're thinking that gay people are sick, but I, they, I, I mean, I need to be respected for who I am. So that's just the rule. And I, I don't understand some religions, but yet I respect whoever's, you know, beliefs are, and that doesn't have to come into the science. Now, I think it's more than that. It's an opportunity to learn. To me, it's, I love learning. So I, 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 I want to learn about the differences and the, dif the diversity that you can actually find in STEM maybe more than in another environment. At least 
maybe I'm again very naive, but my institution seems to have a very good policy for equity and diversity. And so I do see a lot of diversity in my corridors and I want to learn from anyone who has a different experience than me. Like for example, today is just a big pleasure for me to hear about all these stories. I'm just, thank you very much for sharing all this, <laughs> ladies. It's just amazing. But um, yeah, so, you know, respect and a will to be educated um, mm -hmm. is what I want. Uh, when it comes to um, probably there is still bias into the hiring and the accessibility. So maybe we can inform more at the, you know, like in schools and, and I think visibility also might promote uh, better access and, and following the barriers that difference is an obstacle to STEM. So, you know, you know, going by example, mm -hmm. hopefully what institutions should be doing and maybe individually you can do. Right, right. So moving now a little bit more towards the systemic side of things. Uh, First, have you, like uh, all of you have touched a little bit upon it, but would you like to elaborate? Is there something you'd like to elaborate on? Any systemic disparities that hit you particularly uh, during your career in STEM? Like, uh, not like for, for both of you, maybe Francisca and, and Karishma, and for you also, Jardin, uh, in, in terms of uh, not, not just very little like uh, social interaction sort of disparities. I'm not talking about that, but something you have consistently noticed in, in, in the system probably that, uh, oh, some like, I know this example is thrown around a lot in the corporate uh, sector of things where somebody else is getting promoted over you and you it doesn't make sense why until much later you're like, oh, maybe I am this particular minority or this particular section of society. That is why one is getting preferred over me or, or something of the sort. Has it, uh, have you ever faced something of, of, of that kind in your STEM careers? Uh, anyone could go, maybe Karshma, you can start. Not a specific instance, but sometimes you have these times in your life where you're just a victim of the system on all fronts, you know. For example, there's no maternity policy, right? This is 2010. And then when you tell them, okay, I'll take a semester off. Um, I'll take a semester off. I'll come back next semester. They say, oh, but you're international. You can't take a semester off. We have to show you in the role. Otherwise, your visa will be in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So you've not thought this out. Basically, nobody who has developed the program or the has thought this through that how is an international student going to get pregnant i mean i don't think that is rocket science really to think that a foreign student in the united states may want to have a baby like certainly not but nobody thought this oh no no you can't do this oh but you can't do that we can't give you zero hour because you're international you may have to leave the country for six months so it was it was like i basically said a hot mess and then you're a victim from all aspects of the system right yeah yeah, I mean, the only thing you can take away from it is when we are in leadership positions, we'll make sure we think this through a little bit. A little but there's, bit. there's some time for that. You can't always change things at that time, you know. Mm. Otherwise, you'll be again labeled the troublemaker. And the Correct. One exactly. always has issues like, uh, well, are you planning to change the university or get a PhD? What's your goal? Like, what's your five-year plan? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Uh, how about you, Francisca? Okay, uh, like when I first started off as a graduate assistant at the University of Cross River State, um, in my department, Department of Medical Biochemistry, I am the only female there. So in a male-dominated department, and so you, of course you should know what to expect in such a situation. So most times I, they tend to tell you what to do, and you don't have a choice than to just listen, considering the fact that they are way above you, academic wise and uh, by profile. So whatever it is, I just tend to listen at this very stage and I don't try to contest or to object. So but as long as it's not, it doesn't harm me in any way. So I just mm -hmm. listen and then follow the laid down rules and policies at the moment. So that is it basically, thank you. Mm -hmm. And you Geraldine, have you ever experienced something like that? 
You know, I feel very privileged because I feel like I've never had any discriminatory event happen to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's hard for me to position me on this because I really feel very privileged on that. But um, what, I, what I see now is how, you know, our society and our institution are completely heteronormative. <laughs> And so this can be, in a sense, sometimes um, it, it can become, and I think, especially for trainees um, with kind of old fashioned supervisor, it can become a way of discrimination. So this should be addressed. Which again is an amazing segue. I like how all the questions are properly leading into the segues into my next questions. Uh, in the in the long courses, again, both Geraldine and Karishma have had relatively longer careers uh, in STEM uh, than Francisca, but uh, for all three of you, uh, have you noticed any changes that are happening in, in, the, in the kind of students you are probably mentoring, in the attitudes of the people around you since the time you started? Or if you would like to go even back while growing up, the kind of societies you were observing or your, your parents would have told us, Ki, you know, sort of in our time, this wasn't a thing and this is something new that is happening or something like that. Do you see some positive or regressive, any kind of change that stands out to you as either troublesome or promising? Uh, anybody could start, maybe Karishma? Um, I mean, there have been some really good, uh, I, I think I'm seeing more young Indian women certainly being assertive and out there, which is very, very good to see. Of course, they are urban, semi-urban, and they do come from privileged backgrounds, I mean, economically, where they can, you know, take those calls. But uh, that, that has been an excellent sign. So you see a lot of young girls charting their path, saying, you know, I want to work for two years, then go and get a PhD in Europe, then do something else. People saying, oh, I don't want to do a PhD. I want to have my own company and, you know, start a startup. Young Indian women saying, oh, your marriage is not everything. It will happen when it happens. Correct. So even hearing them talk about this openly means they believe in it, means they have people around them who are also supporting this. Correct. So that has been wonderful, actually. Correct, correct. And have you noticed anything more systemic, like some 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 rules or policies that maybe uh, I don't like? Depends if if you have had the interaction or noticed. Like, are there any systemic policies you have noticed that have changed in the uh, in the past few years or past few decades because of certain push maybe uh, women scientists or uh, uh, minorities are giving in in the STEM environment in India or in the US. Anywhere. So there are, at least in India in the last 10 years, there have been career break fellowships for women to return. There have also been those that support relocation. Uh, so finding a new job in a new environment. Well, um, so th they have definitely been there. There are definitely grants and fellowships for women. I mean, the challenge sometimes is to mainstream them, right? You don't want it to be treated like a um, one-off thing or, or kind of like less than the proper grant. You know, this is a women-only grant, so it must be easier to get, Correct. right? So, that, so, so with affirmative action, that that aspect comes in, and they are not treated mainstream enough, which is why even many women will not want to get that. They would rather compete for the big proper grant, what they call. So they do exist. Lots of women are taking advantage of it. It has. Def I have seen examples where it has prevented careers from being completely derailed Correct. after maternity, after marriage, after relocation. Right. Yes. How, how, what is your opinion on this, Geraldine? I kind of forget for, forgot what the stem of the question was, but um, uh, I yeah, think no, the change I see is the societal change into is this is this what it's about societal changes and how and, and anything right? policy yeah correct correct since the time you were growing up or the stories that you have heard to today probably. Yeah, well, you know, my parents, they're not happy I'm gay, and um, they're part of this, um, you know, generation where this is just unacceptable, and I think it's changing. So, yes, there is a change. Hopefully, there's a worldwide change, although if you look at the laws and, the, as you say, the systemic things that actually protects that, uh, it's not equal everywhere, and so hopefully... You know, it's going to move forward everywhere in any corner of the globe for that. Um, and uh, in the STEM environment, I think um, if I look at the youth in the streets and how 
you know, it, it's changing. Everyone is more open to be themselves and, and, and they don't fear of being judged. Um, it might be very specific to Quebec because Quebec is one of the most advanced places in the world for LGBTQ rights. And so um, it's, it's a very privileged place. Once again, I'm very naive on this subject uh, worldwide, but I think I can see the change in my lifetime. <laughs> um, and so, yes, there will be change. And hopefully the new generation of scientists that are being trained in the lab and who's going to become the future PIs, they will have a change in mind and a way to change policy just because they will think about the, what they need, you know. So, Good. yes, there is change. Good. It's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Slow and steady. <laughs> you power through. <laughs> How about you, Francisca? What's, what's your experience been about this? Yes, um, there's noticeable change within my community as regards the journey in STEM. In my interactions with, um, uh, with girls as a girl child mentor, I am able to hear them speak up and uh, in what they really want to become in the future. Some you hear them talking about becoming neurosurgeons, becoming astronauts, and all that. Those are great dreams. And hearing them speak of this really gives me so much joy. And also in Nigeria, there are also policies that are being put in place that includes women in uh, both leadership uh, positions. And though it, is, it hasn't gotten to the level it's supposed to be, but there is massive progress in the right direction. Mm -hmm. That's, that's pretty cool to hear. Um, I think knowing we can have the next question for the audience or do yeah. we read the comments first? We have a lot of comments, like 34 messages. Uh, I will prepare the audience poll, Priyanka. You can go on meanwhile reading the comments if you want because it will take just two, three few min minutes to create the poll, okay? Okay, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm gonna try and see what people have to say and if there are any stories they want to share. Um, uh, Karinder Malhi said she, uh, uh, she, I'm assuming it's a she, I'm sorry. Uh, I am a disability uh, leader and I love to see about different speakers of parliament. Uh, Karinder, if you are here, would you like to share something about your story? You can turn on your mic and speak if you like. Um, I don't know if she's still here. Um, uh, Priyanka, she has disability. She's has disability issues, so she cannot. Probably you oh, can. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I can. I can go ahead. Um, there is uh, a lot of uh, attendees today from uh, Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, Iowa, England, um, British Columbia, and then um, okay. So Karinder has another question. Uh, she says, I have a question with disability. Can all government have faith in disability? Um, I'm, I'm guessing by faith, she means um, faith in the potential of people who may be dis disabled. Um, does anybody have anything to share on, on the topic? I, I don't know. I, I, I am telling that none of us are actually in leading policy making decisions in the government. So anything anybody is saying here would be completely coming from a personal space too. So if uh, you could go ahead, Karishma, if you have something to share. No, I actually, uh, I, I mean, we all agree with this. We all agree with this. It's the, it's the implementation that is the challenge, at least in, in our country. But I'm curious to know how... Um, your institute handles it, Geraldine, because they seem to have a very advanced policy on DEI. So I would just want to learn, actually, at this point. Well, um, it's it's new, so it's taking place. It's been set up in this last maybe year or two years for you know having a more inclusive environment. But I have to say, like I don't have anyone with some. How, how can I say this, like significant physical disability in my environment. Um, and um, I'm not sure how the institution would adapt the environment to it. I think uh, I can see it as physically possible and 
um, and it definitely shouldn't be an obstacle, although um, I identify a lack of visibility of this example um, of, of how uh, this is actually implemented in STEM. But um, I have to be honest, I'm very naive on this topic and I don't know if there is a, you know, the government says you shouldn't have a bias. You sh it shouldn't be a reason for unemployment or a reason for not selecting that person. And always uh, in the hiring process, it always should be on the, you know, abilities, uh, education and the, the, this requirement. So it shouldn't be biased against physical disabilities. Um, I know that the Canadian research chair also actually implemented an EDI thing that uh, any institution had to have representation of different categories that they consider diversity and have a research chair attributed to a certain percentage of these categories. And that includes uh, women in science, that includes disabilities, that includes uh, visible minorities. Uh, this include also uh, so the you know bias on age. So whether it's young researchers or old researchers, sometimes are being discriminated for this. So um, I guess maybe that's one way Canada has um, kind of contributed um, sy systemically to change those. Yeah, uh, that's what comes into mind right now. How about you, Francisca? Have you noticed any any specific policies to include people with disabilities around you, or uh, have you met anybody in STEM with an experience? Um, except on the aspect of uh, non-governmental organizations, which I'm aware of certain organizations running uh, specific uh, programs and policies for people living with disabilities. But as for uh, government policies i am not really aware or uh, concerning that i'm not really aware of that but i'm really certain about certain non-governmental organizations which run inclusive policies for people living with disabilities so mm -hmm. that's basically um, i'll just add one thing to that that we india reframed our science technology innovation policy recently 2020 okay. 2021 and two inclusions in the equity and inclusion thematic group were one LGBTQIA populations in India to be given parental leave, spousal benefits, relocation benefits, like, uh, like uh, I, I, on, on terms with uh, uh, what you call men, women, couples, for example. Mm -hmm. And the second point was regarding age. So India has had been plagued by an ageism problem where you have major grants, fellowships, faculty positions that say 40 years. 40 years. It doesn't matter whether you got your PhD at 39 or so. The cutoff is 40 years. So it's not PhD plus 10 years, which even then one could make sense. Okay. Right. So that was also now how it gets implemented. The question is, it's all on paper. It's there. People thought about it. How are we going to implement this? Hmm. That is going to be, well, that's going to be the challenge. And I think anyone who can solve the implementation aspect deserves the highest civilian honor the country can give. <laughs> Well, you see, Karishma, in Canada, if institutions actually don't um, apply it, then they are, the money is off. So it's a good incentive. It's like whether you do it or we just take all the money back. And we're talking millions of dollars. Correct. So Correct. That's a good incentive. Correctly. They're very motivated. Good so there has to be some... Um, Penalty, yes, if that's the right word, but something that if you don't do it, this is going to happen. Yeah, right? it, yeah. can't, it can't necessarily operate on goodwill and trust, unfortunately. Mm. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it takes very motivated people uh, uh, at the lead, in the leading space, yes. Very much. And like, generally, one thing is, you know, you have to have the right leader for the right job. Just because someone is senior, just because someone has 150 publications, doesn't mean they will treat DEI with the same passion as someone's lived experience or treat being a mother in science with the same passion as someone's lived experience, right? So like you have a men, a room full of men talking about whether women should have abortion laws. You can't have a men a room full of 65 year old men discussing what do we do about mothers in science? Correct. Right, I mean, Correct. So you need to fit the right leader to the right role which is again a mega, mega webinar conversation. <laughs> <laughs> In itself, correct. Okay. Uh, 
Amla, Amla Jatal. I think I have thrown the poll question and uh, I hope everyone has answered. I can see 10 people have already answered. I would, if you, uh, I would like to say to everyone in audience, if you would like, please participate in this poll. I will end this poll in one minute. Thank you. And Priyanka, you can continue. When it ends, I will let you know, okay? Okay, perfect. So uh, Amla Jatal is saying, uh, to Francisca point, Francisca's point, as a girl, when all these restrictions are enforced growing up, I am guessing she means about when you spoke uh, about, about the skating and, and stuff like that. Um, what are the negative behaviors that can manifest in women? And what are some steps women can take to overcome them? Um, I'm guessing in inside you probably neg like in in negative rebellious behaviors. I'm I'm assuming is what she's trying to say. Yeah. All right. It, Thank you very much. Inside you, yeah. And and how yeah, do you, how do you deal with that to remain focused? All right. Thank you very much. Now, sincerely, you negativity surrounds you. You it dampens your spirit and makes you feel uh, less of yourself and it tends to develop this sense of low self-esteem within you. So at this point, all you need is just that single push within yourself. That is where I came, when I said uh, self-confidence. So once you have that level of self-confidence within you, whatever everyone around you is saying just doesn't matter anymore at that point. So that negativity, that dampened spirit and everything just tends to disappear because you believe in yourself and you know you can actually achieve this. So that is what I tell uh, these girls I, may, I mentor. I, because when we first run our um, self-esteem uh, program, I, I tend to help them because I believe there are so many girls out there. Like, so I tend to educate them and uh, help them build healthy self-esteem. So that even if whatever they want to pursue, be it in STEM or whatever uh, aspect of life, they can be rest assured that they are, mentally and emotionally fit for it. So without feeling uh, any form of pressure from family or from within. Thank you. That's nice of you to do, Francisca. More power to you. Uh, would, would, uh, you. would you, Geraldine or Karishma, have to add something to that? Is there something particularly you have to make sure that to not get into a negative cycle of emotions or, or feelings? I, mean, I, I I think it happens to all of us, you know, to be honest. I mean, it does, it does happen. And um, I, we just move on. I think we just move on. I, 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 I kind of keep liking to, I keep liking to remember uh, why I was here in the first place, why I chose to come back to India in the first place, why I chose an academic job in the first place. Yeah. And you, Geraldine? Yeah, you have to be careful about um, dealing with your emotion and your professional life. And um, sometimes the best thing is just to take a night on it. <laughs> you know, anger comes, it comes. There's so many things in your life that is going to, and, and sometimes even in your personality, like me, I, I get angry very easy. Um, and so I learned to just uh, take a breath, you know, not react on the, on the spot. I think that's the key. Just uh, take some time. Go, go walk. Go breathe, <laughs> and um, and take advice. You know, at one point, if you feel like um, it's you're not right, then you just talk about it. Um, take advice and 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 share um, more than um, fight <laughs> on your own. Don't fight on your own. Like that, that's not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> that's an important point too you just don't fight keep fighting it inside yourself that's true well it would so, be uh, nice if we could have like a common fight but in peace you know <laughs> right be human about the fight i'm loving the, the thing it, it's going to be my tagline for this the, what what is the major takeaway is be human and be respectful that's it <laughs> that's all it takes Okay, so Barb Carr says, I had to hide my pregnancy when I went on maternity leave. I was asked to obtain licenses while on maternity and 23 years later, we ought to be better at recognizing families occur in workforce. 
so yeah that that sort of reinforces what both of, both of you said um then uh what are the questions thank you everybody for the compliments for this panel uh it, it has been nice everybody's been really heartening and kind in sharing their their stories uh i hope everybody is able to relate and get something from from their stories um Amla Jatar are some women who don't work towards equalizing the gender gap in STEM. Uh, um, does anybody want to take this? Priyanka, uh, before yes. we go this, I will end this poll session because my internet is like fluctuating and it is sometimes kicking me out and then I am back in. Kicking me okay, out. Okay. Before we go, we can discuss this poll question. I'm going to end this poll and after that, after this discussion, I will create the, the rest of the poll. Okay. Okay, perfect. Sounds so good. The poll is ended now, and we can see results that uh, twelve out of eighteen people they participated in the poll. I'm not sure if you all of you can see the results. Uh, share yes. results. You can now just click on the, yeah on the polls down here. Yeah, yeah. they are shared, right? So we have sixty-seven percent people who voted for equal opportunities for leadership role. Priyanka, you can read the question and you can read the options and you can continue discussion on this. Correct. Yes. So the question we wanted to ask everybody was: What improvements do you suggest for a more inclusive work environment based on gender equality? And so the options were: equal salary and benefits, equal opportunity for leadership roles, uh, transparent ombud system at work. Free optional counseling sessions at work and available internal gender support group. So these were the options, and none of the above for anybody who doesn't care about inclusivity. Uh, most of most of them, mo most of the audience has suggested equal opportunities for leadership roles. I guess that that then again has a lot to do with the systemic uh, inclusivity, and like. Uh, uh, Karishma, you were also saying you need the right, right people in the right leadership roles to execute what's on paper. Yeah, yes, absolutely. but absolutely. Uh, would any of you have to say something about uh, the other options, uh, equal salary and benefits and a free, maybe optional counseling sessions at work uh, for, for minorities, uh, for all kinds of minorities, including gender and religion and, and caste and economic backgrounds? Uh, do you think it would be helpful to have those? Have you noticed any institutes that have them in place at the moment? Any, anyone could go ahead. So many universities and institutes in India do have mental health support systems, but I think like anywhere in the world, they are overstretched. Hmm. Uh, the supply versus demand is completely skewed. Okay. Yeah. And so obviously people who can who need it and can afford it, seek private mental health support. Correct. But there's so many never are, are, ne are never addressed as a result. Ha have either of you noticed anything, Francisca and Jardine? I Maybe mean, Francisca could go ahead, yeah. Okay, considering the fact that Nigeria is still a developing country, I think they are even developing in every aspect. So I haven't really noticed any um, mental health policy being put in place, except uh, maybe for private uh, mental health uh, counselors and all, but government-wise, there is nothing in place on that aspect, which I am aware of. So basically, you have to sort it out yourself, maybe between you and your family, and maybe your God. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep, you said it. How about you, Jalin? Have you have you noticed anything in place at the moment? Um, I think some of them are changing. You know, the opportunities are uh, evolving, and I think the fact that um, you know, it's like. I'm, I'm making a parallel and I'm not sure I'm very a fan of it, but you know, in the cinema now, there's a place for women. You have to have heroes that are women. You have to have a place for people of color. You have to have a place for visible minorities. Um, and so, um, you know, they have ratios uh, now in the Hollywood business, you know, you have to have representation. Um, 
which, you know, some people are not happy with that um, because it's forced recognition and um, some people believe it's the way to do because you have to force change. Um, I think this is also happening in STEM, you know, by doing this, for example, ratio of research chair that can be attributed in different categories and have to be attributed in different categories, that's going to induce change. And so this is going to also, you know, benefit equal opportunity for all. Um, you know, you, you have, a, I don't know if you are familiar with this cartoon of explaining equity and, and, and that it's different than equality in which, Correct. you know, everyone is looking at a soccer game and, but there's a fence. And so the little one has to have like this step, but the key of this image is that you don't put a, you don't put a, a step, but you, you take the fence away, you know, Correct. that's, that's, that's the solution. And that, I don't think I've seen this happening. <laughs> but I want to add an option to your poll. And I think the key thing, the key thing is education. Education is going to be the solution. Hmm. And you can educate yourself at different stage in your life. You can hopefully get more open. But then if you educate the new generation, hopefully, you know, what, this is what we do is that we offer better worlds for our children. And so we learn from our mistakes and we change them. So that also avoid anger. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm going to create the breakout rooms right now. Yes. I have and then three breakout rooms. One is with Karishma, Geraldine, and Francisca. And Priyanka, you will go to one of the, these breakout rooms. Nasira is here. She will go to another breakout rooms. And I will also be joining like simultaneously. I will be jumping around in all breakout rooms together. And everyone okay. can choose uh, breakout rooms which they want to go. And uh, I will definitely, whenever it will uh, end, I will extend it. We still have 20, 25 minutes that we can create for this breakout room. They are going to be open right now. So. Perfect. How how do you pick which breakout room you go to? If this is new you for can me, just I'm choose saying. yourself either, or I can assign also. I can also assign. For example, I will assign Krishma to Krishma's breakout room, to Gerald to Geraldine. Okay, so Krishma when you front. scroll down, there is a list of the three breakout rooms, and you can choose yes. which one to sign. Yes, you okay. can choose what you want to do, and I can see Priyanka. I was just looking. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm looking for Francisca. Okay. <laughs> Francisca and Priyanka, you will go to uh, yeah, I will I, go to Geraldine and Nasira, you will go to uh, Karishmas. And are we coming back after? Or? Yes, you will come back afterwards. Okay, everyone okay. will come back. See you. See you. See you. Three will go to. Okay, we have Amala, Ananya, Chna, Del, okay. Francisca, I actually created the breakout rooms for you and people are waiting for you there.
You said you can choose. Uh, yeah, you can choose to. You can I move. Could, I could around. choose. Can I? Can I go? Where to do you want to go, Stephanie? Where do you want to go? At uh, Geraldine, because I'm also in Canada. Geraldine? I think that makes more okay, sense. I will yeah. move to Geraldine. Okay. You Thank are you. To... No worries. I don't see Francisca now. Arachi, would you like to join certain room? I can join, I can move you to Karishma and Ananya, I will move you to Karishma too. And Adena, let me go now. There. Sorry, everyone, I had a break in network and uh... I do hope you you enjoyed the discussion. So if there is any question or whatever you want us to talk about, I am here.
Okay, everyone. I hope everyone had really, really good time in our breakout rooms and everyone is coming back. Okay, sorry if I interrupted anyone's conversation, you know, during breakout rooms. And um, I hope you all got a chance to talk to the speakers and to share what you wanted to share. With this note, um, I will, before we go further, I have to actually put spotlight on our speakers first and our moderator. And uh, okay, let me first do that. And then I will tell you what is our next thing here. Okay, uh -huh. here at the spotlight. And who is uh, Francisca is not here. I am so glad right now. I am just doing the questions asking part because I am really not good at all of this organizing thing. <laughs> uh, you are really good. You are I'm awesome. happy you are to so have Noin. <laughs> and you have done excellent job. I'm very much impressed. And okay, so before we, uh, Priyanka, you give any closing remarks or anything yes. and our uh, speakers give. Adina wants to say something. Adina, if you can turn on your video, I will put a spotlight on you and you can share your views if you can still hear me. Are you there? Okay, you can turn on your video. I will put a spotlight on you. Okay, here we go. Okay, here you are, Adina. Everyone can hear you now. You can share your views and you can share your thoughts. You have- okay. Hi, Adina. Hi, you know, uh, I think it will be okay, I wish. And also I'm uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, when I was at school, my father and everyone don't want to, and they, do, they don't think that girls can be engineers. For this reason, I choose to be an engineer and an architect. I'm going to university and, and uh, about six years ago. On that time, girls are really, uh, place in this classes and uh, no one in every uh, class two or three but we continue to uh, learn and uh, i i very uh, like to be uh, on here for this reason i'm going to the university and i graduated uh, last month but un unfortunately after we finished our uh, university taliban attack in afghanistan and uh, we can't do any job but uh, up to now, I don't lose my hope and I work online. And uh, I think women can do everything that they want, especially in the, some underdeveloped countries. Women have very good uh, priorities and they can do something. But in Afghanistan, some of women, uh, especially my family problems and government problems, security problems, uh, we can work. But uh, I want to work online, and I will continue my work online and working with um, women's uh, group, and also with uh, men's group. It's not any problem to work with anyone. But um, I have very good confidence about my work, about my uh, career, and uh, my. I have a little sister that she said that I want to be also engineer, but my father said in this government you can't be an uh, engineer. And it's very funny for me because the uh, situation of Afghanistan is very bad. Very strong uh, aim, strong view for future. And uh, also, in my view, women can do everything that they want. Uh, but sometimes, some people don't let them. I think it um, it must not be a, ba a barrier between their work and uh, their you know, aims, their goals. For this reason, uh, I'm very happy to join you. Yeah, meeting my friends with you and with everyone of uh, this group. And uh, thank you very much if you have any questions. Do you want? I'm here. 
Okay, uh, thanks, Adina. Actually, internet connection is a little bit fluctuating. It's same with me. I was yeah. kicked out so many times from <laughs> this meeting. But thanks, Adina, for joining us. I came into contact with Adina through when I started my global welfare program, and she is now project coordinator for uh, vocational training programs that I started as a volunteer, and we created I and Adina together for personal uh, development and professional development and also some education science series. Currently it's me and Adena who are working on it and we are making the list and we are just looking for the possible dates to start those sessions. And she is really, really enthusiastic and she has done already a great work there. Thanks Adena for joining us and sharing your story. And with that note, I will leave this floor to Priyanka and Priyanka, you can go ahead and you can ask our speakers for their closing remarks and then we will close it, okay? Yes. Thank you again, Adina. It was really, really nice to have you here and, and, and hear what you had to say. Coming back to our amazing speakers today, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for being so gracious in sharing your opinions and stories. Uh, it was it was really helpful, I hope, to everybody to relate to it. Uh, any Any last notes you would like to share? Anything we didn't discuss that you would you would just like to mention now, uh, you can go ahead. We still have some time. Anybody who wants to start, maybe Karishma, you want to start? I think I shared my whole life story here now. Looking back. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know this was going to become the, that kind of session. I, I feel it, it's been cathartic, to be it's honest. It's a group therapy session. <laughs> yeah, it has been. Now that I look back and feel my troubles right now are nothing compared to what I went through. So honestly, Thank you. It was a great session. It was wonderful. You put this together really nicely. It was great being with you, Geraldine and Francesca. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, Francesca, I have a collaborative grant with Nigeria, so we'll be in touch. I'm just plugging in my personal research here. <laughs> Go ahead. Anybody wants to plug in their work? <laughs> so I may have to visit Nigeria sometime in the next year. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yes, let's see you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say. All of, by the way, uh, just a note, everybody's uh, LinkedIn and Twitter accounts are linked on the Eventbrite website. So if anybody wants to independently get in touch with each other, uh, I think you can do it from those social media platforms. But yeah, any any of you want to say anything uh, before we part? Jaldine, you maybe? Well, thank you for planning this. Like I've learned a lot and uh, I was very inspired by both of you, Karishma and Francisca. Thank you so much for sharing all this. It's uh, It was great. And um, and that's it. I think we covered so many, so many things. It's, and it's very late in India. It's time for Dodo, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How about you, Francisca? Any, any last parting thoughts you would like to share? Yes, I would like to say a very big thank you to everyone, especially Geraldine and Karishma. I've really learned a lot from you. It's a rare privilege for me to be part of this panel discussion. And I hope to be where you are today and even beyond. So I want to say a really big thank you to you mm -hmm. all. And Priyanka, nice moderation. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> if my STEM career doesn't work, I know I can do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay very well thank you everybody uh swiss is always here we are all cheering for each one of you who have attended more strength and power to all of you in your journeys thank you for joining i think i think we will end it here um hope to all yeah. see you uh, knowing you want to say I something think before ending i was hearing one voice about the session am i muted no i don't know knowing you're getting cut Is she still here? Yeah, she's still here. Okay. Okay, let's just finish. I don't know if she's sending a message. We'll write to her. Maybe she can write a message. Maybe. Oh, 
sorry i am back and yeah, she's my back. internet is i don't know when you need your internet the most <laughs> at, the, at the same time it deceives you right so yes. i was just going to say that we are hearing one voice throughout the session that is francisca's 22 months old daughter <laughs> i would her, you know, she is listening to all the talks. If it is possible, Francisca, bring her in, and I would like, we would like to have a conversation with her. You know, at this young age, she is listening to big women like scientists and well accomplished people here. So it's it's great to have her in the picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Hey. please. laughs> Mama, say Hi. hello to everyone. Say hello. Oh, yes, hello. Say hello. Yeah, hello. Let me take a screenshot. Now everyone get ready. Yes. Okay. Hello. Here we go. I took the screenshot. Oh, and thank with that note. Bianca, oh, back to you. You can end the session now. Yes. Mama. Perfect. Mama. <laughs> okay. Thank you everybody again. I hope to see everybody around. Bye. Thank Bye you. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a great Bye. evening. Good night. You Bye. too. See you.